Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. So we are going to uh, this will be our second installment of our uh, lecture series about slavery in the antebellum period. We're doing more stuff in class on resistance and underground railroad, those kind of things. But uh, here's our background notes, right? So just one thing to remember: this is an era of what we call chattel slavery, and it's a term used by a lot of uh, history professors, those kind of things. Uh, chattel is a word that means property, specifically property other than real estate, and so that means at this time. Uh, African American slaves in the South were treated literally as property. And like property, they were bought and sold at auction. So here is a uh, auction notice, 1823, uh, for slaves. This is in where it's actually in Richmond, Virginia, I believe it is. Uh, so you can see they advertise these auctions uh, and who was being offered uh, to per to purchase. You can see here's Harper's Weekly magazine. This is uh, Harper's Weekly was one of the uh, big um, first like big magazines in the country is popular all over the country and it shared a lot of news and history and stuff. Let's share sketches and pictures. So here you have this engraving and it shows uh, slaves are lined up in new clothing. So wearing, you know, European clothing, that kind of stuff all lined up here uh, for inspection by potential buyers. Um, and a lot of times slaves you know, were, were told by the current master that, you know, if they didn't, you know, clean up, if they didn't appear nice or uh, act well in front of these potential buyers, they would uh, have worse punishments coming down the road. Here's another one, Charleston, uh, South Carolina, this is 1856. So you can see the idea of the um, of the uh, slave auction here. Notice they, you know, they highly focus on the guys where it carrying the whips, those kind of things. Um, you know, as you see, uh, slaves being auctioned off uh, in Charleston. Um, obviously, punishments are a big thing. Here's a very famous photo photograph from a uh, post Civil War era, uh, showing uh, the back of a of a then freed slave. Um, bounds were set on a lot of these uh, plantations where there were certain areas that were were uh, were forbidden for slaves to go, and so you couldn't go into certain places without getting uh, punishment. And so it could be leaving the property, could be leaving a certain line, could be going outside of a field or slave quarters, where it might be. Um, that was that. Now, the owners had zero boundaries. Now, the owners could go in any slave cab they wanted to any time. They could touch anybody, talk to anybody they wanted to. You know, if slaves were even forbidden to talk to certain people. If you were a possibly a field slave uh, working in the, in the field, you were not allowed to talk to the lady of the house. Whereas the owners did anything they wanted to. That included, um, you know, sexual relations with uh, their slaves as well. And obviously, the whip is kind of the biggest way that slaves were. Uh, punish and so usually it's very, very public. Um, sometimes you have uh, slave overseers who are actually slaves who are kind of like ranked higher than other slaves that are forced to whip their fellow slaves, uh, even their family members sometimes. And so these punishments are pretty rip rough when it comes to that kind of stuff. If you try running away, uh, even worse punishments could take place because of that it could be you know whippings, beatings, um, you know torture in some ways. Uh, hamstring was a good way to do this. You would uh, cut the back of the foot, the hamstring, or remove a toe, making it harder to run. Uh, all things that could be done a a as punishments. Um, obviously, it was legal. To, it was legal to kill a slave, but a lot of slave owners wouldn't do that because um, it was property, right? And so it was an investment that they saw it as in their context. Um, also, families were used as another way as well to uh, punish slaves. Um, you know, if you talk about in the last video the phrase being sold down river. Typically, treatment was worse in the deeper south, uh, the Alabama, Mississippi areas, versus in the northern areas, say like Missouri or Tennessee or Kentucky. And so, one of the things that would happen is they would threaten to break up families and sell them somewhere else if somebody ran away. So if I try running away, they would sell my family potentially as a as as a, a punishment to me. And they knew that was the case. Um, here's the living conditions here. Are, here are slave cabins. Our pictures are taken around the Civil War era, I believe. Um, you know, obviously slaves had separate quarters, small little cabins, uh, no heat, little food. A lot of times uh, they got scraps that were there uh, that were sent out to the to the to the uh, the slave cabins. But then you know, typically they all have small gardens to grow and keep their own food. Um, once in a while they would get you know a pig or that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, so obviously a lot, a lot of southern traditions for food come from this idea of barbecuing down south where you throw, um, you know, get coals going, throw a pig in the ground, that kind of stuff. Uh, was started at this time, was brought with them from some African traditions, those kind of things. Um, different nutritional uh, foods that were kind of uh, uh, popular in the south were brought from some of the slave uh, uh, traditions. So uh, it's kind of a big part we see there. Um, obviously families being broken up and sold a lot. We just talked about that a little bit. Um, families should be broken up, you know, children, wives, husbands, etc. Uh, we're all part of that. Now, religion was taught to slaves, and so 
Uh, there's usually some kind of some uh, some owners did Sunday services or some did church services, those kind of things. Um, and for a lot of slaves, religion became a freedom. A lot of stories like the Exodus story uh, in in uh, uh, in the Bible uh, became really popular for slaves. Well, the idea of getting free and finding a way to get to freedom. And so you have a lot of spirituals that begin to learn, to use that religion to become the basis of a of freedom idea. So here are some ways that um, they would uh, control slaves here. So we have the slave muzzles, so we would be bit spit at that kind of stuff. They would put on slaves who were trying to fight back. Notice the um, uh, irons around the neck here to control people. Here are slave brands, so like an animal, like a cow, um, you would brand slaves to know who the ownership was, whether it be um, on the face or the back or wherever uh, it might be. Uh, you saw those kinds of brands used. Um, here's an anti slavery pamphlet. So, this is actually an anti slavery pamphlet, but it's kind of showing uh, the violence and stuff of branding somebody and kind of shows that etching an image of, of that on there. You would see the leg iron, so as we go around the legs, um, you kind of see the shoes aren't very high quality. Uh, you might not get a lot of them, okay, a lot of times. Uh, but, you know, very simple clothing, you know, scrap, you know, maybe one set of clothes a year, one pair of shoes a year, kind of survive through. Here's a slave tag, so it tells you who you are. If you were off your property, you had to have this on you, so you knew who you bought, who, uh, um, owned you, who you belonged to, so you have a certain number uh, that went along with that and a certain ownership type idea, so it can uh, relay back and make sure that whoever was, you know, uh, a slave was, was uh, following the rules they had to. I mean, slaves did leave property with permission. I mean, they did errands and ran, you know, that kind of stuff if you were trusted, but you had to have this tag on to identify yourself as a slave for one and be, um, and be uh, to you make sure that you weren't a runaway type situation. Uh, here we see a slave cabin again. Notice these are not very big places here. Um, you know, very small, you know, uh, clapboard uh, cabins. Roofs are kind of half fall apart here. You know, the only time you get the heat is with the wood you, get, you cut yourself. As I said, it's, it's not a very comfortable type of situation here. Uh, there were some different uh, slavery culture things that kind of brought here. And obviously, black Christianity is a big thing. Uh, Baptist and Methodist, kind of the, the quote unquote Southern Baptist style here. Um, Baptist services were very um, low key. Uh, they don't love dancing, those kind of things. But Southern Baptists a little bit different. Very, very emotional services. They had a lot of spirituals and songs, especially focusing around those freedom ideas that were there. Uh, there were a couple of different languages that um, slaves used to as a way to kind of keep their culture there. Uh, they're called Pidgin or Gula. And these are kind of like um, uh, languages that were a combination of English and kind of some of the different West African languages that were out there. Um, a word you see a lot here, and now and there's a clip, um, the movie Glory, and I was kind of warning this. I watched this Glory. It's from the early 90s, and Denzel Washington is really great in it, by the way. So is Morgan Freeman. The man does not make bad movies. Um, but they use the phrase Bukra, and I was trying to figure what Bukra meant. And Bukra was one of these uh, pigeon words uh, that was a combination of, it actually means white man is what it means. And it was one of these combinations of, of African words that were used by some of the uh, slaves that were, uh, on these plantations, and they combined kind of English from all these other languages that existed yet and made these combination languages. You know, obviously, in families, we talked about in our earlier uh, section on slavery last uh, historical period, was a big thing here, too. I mean, the family was huge, kind of keep the family together. You see the picture in the bottom down here, we've seen this one before. Um, you know, trying to get that nuclear family together, kind of have, you know, an extension kin of, you know, everyone has an aunt and an uncle and cousins, that kind of stuff. It wasn't just, you know, um, family, family, but it was, you know, an extended family of, of friends that kind of became those extra uncles and kind of took, took care of each other. And lastly, music. I mean, those, music, those spirituals were all about the idea of freedom and getting free and trying to keep spirits up when times are bad. You see, you know, the uh, early, early starts of the blues and jazz and those kind of things, the instruments that were used, like banjos and that kind of stuff, as a way to kind of keep that, uh, kind of keep people up and keep people going uh, in this culture of slavery. Now, those are ways that slaves resisted and, uh, so they were kind of interesting. One that was interesting was the idea of Sambo. And so this is actually, honestly, later on became a very racist caricature of African Americans. But a lot of times, African -American, uh, African-American slaves knew what was going on. They could understand, you know, English, that kind of stuff, whereas the white owners thought they couldn't. And so, you know, white owners thought, oh, I'm going to talk about whatever I want to talk about. That's just a slave. They don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, because some slaves would act innocent, right? And kind of act like, you know, they don't know what's going on in front of the owners. And they really did. So they, they knew everything about everybody, what was happening, who was doing what, all that kind of stuff. Because they would act, quote unquote, dumb in front of their in front of the uh, the white ownership or the white leadership or the white uh, uh, slave drivers. Uh, so they would, you know, kind of think that. So you got kind of this caricature of this 
quote unquote, you know, stupid, innocent type person, but really they knew what was going on. It was just a big act uh, to paint a big charade to kind of confuse or help themselves uh, kind of, you know, resist against the slave owners. Um, you know, a lot of times people just refused to work hard. A lot of times there was a lot of just, you know, refusing to work uh, kind of stuff. You may, um, you know, you, you, you work, you just work really slow today. You know, you just don't work very hard today as a way to protest. Um, sabotage, you know, nothing like, you know, messing up, you know, breaking a wagon wheel or <clears throat> accidentally lighting a barn on fire, that kind of stuff we're talking in terms of, um, you know, of resisting against, against owner of the white owners. But you know, it didn't happen a lot, right? It'd be very isolated because something happened. The retribution, the, the punishment was pretty, pretty terrible. Um, there, of course, was also Underground Railroad, which you've heard from, from, you know, from young on. But it was not a real rail. There was no engines. But here instead, it was a series of safe houses and tunnels and stuff to get from the south to the north. And we're trying to get to Canada, remember, because that fugitive slave law exists. Uh, first passed in 1793. It said if you were captured up here in the north, they had to take you back down south. And, in fact, there are uh, places in Wisconsin that were on this uh uh, underground Railroad, including right here in Sox in Sox in a Prairie Sack, I believe in Sock Prairie, there were uh, houses that were involved in the Underground Railroad. In fact, the only and very little underground, underground railroad was actually you know underground. It was just these uh, back rooms and places to hide. That's the only the actual, the actual underground place. The Underground Railroad is in Milton, Wisconsin. The Milton House is a, it's a hotel there. You can go still see it today. Uh, it's there, and there's actually a, a trench that was run from the main hotel back to a little shed, and that was the only underground section of the Underground Railroad. Uh, but obviously, you hear Harriet Tubman and other "quote unquote" conductors who run this railroad help guide people out and get uh, to freedom. And a lot, and you know, there are hundreds, you know, thousands of slaves that were able to escape and get to freedom via this underground railroad. Obviously, you know, when somebody did run away, there were there were the slave hunters and that kind of stuff who would try to find runaway slaves. Here you see the ads they're offering, you know, twelve hundred dollars, you know, if you caught somebody. Um, and you did see free African Americans in the north who were captured and said, Oh, I found this runaway slave and brought down south and a lot of times they were put into slavery even though they were never slaves. And so we'll talk about the story of Solomon North up in class a little bit. Uh, that was who uh, the, the 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 um movie and book Twelve Years of Slave are based off of in turn kind of terms of you know, how that situation happens. Here's some of the examples too like are quilt patterns that are used. I uh, usually put up different places to uh show escapees where to go, right? Where to where to flee and kind of what to do. So like here you have the monkey ranch over here, right? Which told people, you know, you kind of post this quilt square up, tell people, hey, we need to gather up tools, get ready to escape. The drunkard path, you saw this one, you know, to uh, um, don't follow a straight route, go zigzag or kind of find ways around different places as kind of a secret message system uh, to escaping slaves. And by the way, you know, and there's time there actually a lot of slave rebellions happened. Slavery is still happening in, in different parts of the empires down here. And going back to the 1700s, we see a lot of slave rebellions that do take place uh, through Haiti. Most of most them by far is in Haiti down here. Um, and in Cuba and Jamaica and you know, all through South America as well. There are a couple of famous ones in the United States we got to look at real quick. Wolf being the one of Gab uh, the, the conspiracy slave rebellions of Gabriel Prosser and uh, Denmark Vesey. Uh, both these were actually conspiracy where there was supposed to be uh, supposedly a planned revolt that was going to happen. Um, Prosser was, was a literate slave in, in Richmond, Virginia. He was supposedly planned to rebellion in 1800 to make, uh, kill all the owners and stuff and make a kingdom of, of white leaders, whereas um, somebody has found out about it and, and kind of stitched on my guess and they hanged 30 people. Uh, Vesey was a, a free black actually in, in South Carolina, in Charleston, and who supposedly organized over a thousand people and Free African Americans, all slaves, trying to capture and kill and uh, kill the white leadership. Uh, both were when the story this got out, all leadership was hanged and that kind of stuff. And um, were uh, they actually had to bring in you know federal troops and militia to make sure that no big revolt took place. The most famous slave rebellion by far, though, has been the Nat Turner Slave Rebellion of 1831. This is where a slave named Nat Turner led a rebellion in uh, Virginia, which ended, actually ended up uh, going for a few days and uh, killing, uh, I think it was 60 people, I forget, in the end. I uh, hear some uh, etchings of this uh, deal. So the first organized action, it was led by Nat Turner, a guy who thought he saw a divine signal. He actually thought he saw um, uh, blood on the leaves of corn plants out in the field. And that was a sign to rebel. And fight against uh, the, the, the uh, slave-owning elite of, uh, of Virginia. And uh, so eventually he got 80 followers together. They killed uh, the family of the, of the plantation she worked on, killed six more people before being stopped by soldiers. And uh, they found Nat Turner. He was only carrying a sword, nothing else. And uh, eventually he was uh, interviewed by a priest and eventually hanged and captured and flayed and beheaded and put on display. Uh, but that's kind of what happened when these uh, rebellions took place. They actually made a book about 
Goodbye. That's it for this, guys. Thank you very much.